Thank you for the opportunity to join you today, at least by video. I'm sorry that I cannot be with you uh, for this interesting symposium, but it's clearly impossible in this time of COVID. While I don't want to spend my time focused on COVID per se, I think it's interesting to reflect on some, some of the implications that COVID brings to the topic of this symposium. Clearly COVID is the biggest test of the interface between science, policy, politics and society that the world has seen. Every country in some way or another is having to respond or deny in some cases perhaps the scientific evidence in ways that have direct implications uh, for the health of the population and then have flow on effects for how the socioeconomic situation of peoples in every country is being affected by the pandemic. Although it's too early in the evolution of the pandemic to learn and to reflect and fully understand all the issues that the pandemic brings to the fore, I think there are a number of issues that we can start to reflect upon. One of them I'm gonna spend some considerable time on, which is the issues around preparation to what extent were countries prepared for this kind of event? Why were they not prepared for it or responding adequately to it, despite all the evidence that a zoonotic pandemic would at some time emerge? But I think more practically, there will be times when we need to look at the issues of the structure of science advice, the plurality of science advice, that was given, to what extent was there an over-reliance on modeling and, under and not enough consideration, for example, of the role of sociology, social science, psychology in the initial determinations of country strategies. The issues of the skills of the people involved in providing advice, were they adequate and do, did they have the skills to transmit knowledge from and with a lot of uncertainty to the policy community in a way that would lead to appropriate responses? Was there enough plurality in the advice so that one view alone did not dominate? Did it matter whether the advice was coming through formal structures like national academies or science advisory mechanisms? Or was there a uh, contestation from advice from people outside the system. And that led to a whole set of issues which I, we will need to reflect upon, which is the ethics of science advice. What were the roles of science advisors? Did they take into account the inferential risk between the, uh, the data they had and the conclusions they'd reached? What were the behavior of scientists who were not part of the system in playing in the media, in conducting uh, academic debates, sometimes in public, uh, in times criticizing uh, from the outside. There are many, many dimensions to this that one could explore. And, I don't, and, I, and that is work that our center is doing on an ongoing basis, as I'm sure are many other centers, trying to understand the breadth of issues about the system, of science advice, the engagement, the processes, the content, and the ethics in this whole system. Equally, there were a set of issues around communication with the public. How should the science system communicate with the public? How good were they at communicating uncertainty? Was there an over-reliance of using numbers in a rhetorical sense rather than admitting to the uncertainties? How does one explain scientific uncertainty and yet decisions have to be made? And of course, that is the skill of post-normal science in the real world. But what I want to focus on in my comments here is really the issue of preparation. There's a set of, we are all very good in our countries at preparing for 
recurrent moderate impact events. In my country, it may be earthquakes, it may be another country floods, in another country, it might be typhoons. But I said that glibly. In reality, there are countries which have recurrent typhoons or hurricanes and do not prepare well. There are countries that have recurrent uh, earthquakes and do not prepare well. And then there's a broader range of events which are even higher in impact in many cases which are predictable at some rare but not insignificant likelihood for which countries often do not prepare well at all. The Iceland volcano and the ashfall would be an example. A massive space weather event on the scale of the 1850s Carrington event is clearly an example which is of increasingly existential concern given our reliance on, 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 on digital technologies for every part of our life now, and a massive solar flare could in fact disrupt uh, uh, those mechanisms with very short notice. Some people, the scientific expertise in this area, predicts that there's a 50% chance of such an event happening in the next 50 years. How well are countries prepared? for such an event. I do not think we have the resilience uh, see in our systems to cope with such a system event. And pandemics are of the similar nature. In the last few years, we've had a raft of zoonotic events. SARS, MERS, swine fever, sorry, uh, not swine fever, um, uh, bird flu, uh, Zika, Nipa, Ebola. We've seen a large raft of these zoonotic events. With the exception of Ebola, all of them have been reasonably well contained rather rapidly. Ebola was actually very well handled, the West African pandemic, once the cultural and related issues were understood. Sadly, many people died. Too many people died. But once the global science community and health community understood what was going on, it was reasonably well contained. But all along, scientists have been warning that there would be zoonoses that would be less able to be contained. And of course, that is what coronavirus, COVID-19 is. It's a virus which is behaving differently to the presumptions of the other uh, uh, past coronavirus infections. It has a long incubation period, very long in some cases. It can be spread asymptomatically. In some ways, it's not lethal enough, so it therefore is able to spread much more, unlike very lethal viruses, which are easier to contain, because sadly, the host uh, dies before it can be transmitted too far. And so we have a virus which was predictable on epidemiological, virological terms. And yet, by and large, many countries did not handle it well. The, ones, the countries that handled it particularly well were countries that had previously experienced SARS, like Singapore, like Taiwan, that were able to have an infrastructure prepared to respond to a rapid pandemic. Yes, there were in some cases, some downstream uh, blowouts, usually due to systems failure, but the preparation and the immediacy of response was there. 
The other class of country that handled it well were countries that could close their borders rapidly and made definitions to keep the virus out rapidly. Countries like Jamaica, countries like New Zealand, where the border closure meant that the viral load, uh, uh, the, the number of people with the symptoms was very low and with the classic techniques of isolation, contact tracing, the virus was kept under control. But we should reflect on the fact that by and large, for these kinds of events, preparation is not strong. And the reasons are, are the questions I want to pose in this talk are why are we not adequately prepared for predictable, high impact, low frequency, but not very low frequency events like a pandemic, uh, like a space weather event. And we can put climate change probably into the same category because it's certainly happening. The issues are generally not technical. I think the expert scientific communities that study whichever class of event that we're looking at know and have a fairly good idea of the possible range of impacts and the possible range of likelihood of frequency. The issues are largely those of communication, communication from the science community to the policy community, and within the policy community, communication between that and the political community, the final decision makers. And so we need to think about what are going on in those different steps and recognize that the issues are largely not technical, they're ones of cognitive biases and human behavior. Many countries have risk registers. I think Norway has a risk register. New Zealand has a risk register. Those risk registers may or may not be in public, but they are fundamentally a list of possible events for which the country should be prepared with different degrees of preparation, depending on the likely impact and the, uh, and the likely frequency. Risk management, of course, is core to the private sector. There would be no board in a responsible company that does not have a risk committee and does not have a very formal process of assessing risk and mitigating against those risks. In the public sector, that's not so clear. Lists of risk may be identified, the risks may be identified, but just identifying the risk does not ensure that the country takes the appropriate mitigation uh, steps. And I will explore in a moment why that might be the case. Similarly, we are not very good in learning from past events, particularly past events in other countries. Part of that is we move on. We don't want to look backwards. Part of it is we get, can get, get caught up in the blame game. And part of it is we're not actually very good, by and large, in being willing to look at what other countries did well, or what they, and in particular, what they did badly, and extrapolating to our own situations. My own view about why risk registers don't work as well as they should in the public sector really relates to factors like we tend to make them overwhelming and too confusing. There's almost too many risks on them. And in some cases, we have not been good at communicating what level of impact can be expected. Sometimes there's a tendency only to, to talk about the very worst event, the most worst conceivable event, the maximum possible event. And that can seem to the policymaker incredulous or overstated. By having too much in the risk register, 
we might overwhelm them. We might be seen to cry too often, wolf too often. The bigger issues, however, are not those ones. I think the issues are actually more around uh, why the policy community doesn't accept the risk registers to cause actions. And they're really issues of cognitive biases and uh, political behaviors. If a risk register is assumed to provide guidance to the policy community and the political community, then does it also assume that it provides accountability? And of course, accountability creates a set of issues in the political interface. If you are accountable, if you've been advised as a risk and you haven't acted on it, then you'll be blamed. The politician doesn't like that. If on the other hand, you're not advised about it, the politician can say, well, I wasn't advised about it, it's not my fault. And so there's a dynamic in this interplay between the expert community, the policy community and the political community that needs to be explored. If we just focus on the political dynamic, by and large, the mitigations that are needed involve significant investment. And so the choice for the politician is, do I make an investment now for an event that may or may not happen and almost certainly will not happen during the current electoral cycle? That, of course, immediately says, I can defer it. It immediately says there are higher priority things to do for the next electoral cycle that's coming up and I can defer this to another date. And of course, there is always a more pressing question in the immediacy of political cycles, which means that things that could be deferred will be pushed downstream. The fact that the major event might happen next week, but might also happen in 50 years time, is a hard means that you need to prepare for it now, not in 50 years time, is not an easy communication and an easy discussion to have. And then we get into the whole issues of how we communicate risk, which I think is a really important topic in relationship to your symposium. Remember, risk means different things to different people. We as scientists may talk about risk in actuarial terms, People actually perceive risk in relationship to individual cost and benefit uh, uh, in terms of uh, will it affect them, will it not affect them directly. So perception of risk is influenced by a lot of cognitive biases that we don't have time to discuss today. Who's going to be the winner? Who's going to be the loser? if an action is taken now. Politicians think of risk in a very different way. Thank you, think of risk largely in terms of uh, 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 electoral risk, how the policy, the public will see uh, what they have done into the future. Politicians find it easier to deal with things that are certain than things that might happen. And if you think about the contrast between things that you are sure will happen and things that just might happen, the latter always going to be left in the back room to focus on the things in the front room. There's also the issue of invisible benefit. If the event never happens because of adequate prevention, then no political credit will be achieved. And if you think about that, that is part of the problem here. Why would a politician or a policymaker advocate for extensive preparation if they do not think the event is going to happen under their watch? 
Then beyond that, and underneath all of this, is the issue of procrastination. Why do something now? We do it in the future. There's time to leave it for now. It's not urgent. And I think so the issues for the scientific community in communicating about risk, likelihood and impact are not the issues of the science per se, but how one communicates the reality of risk in a way that it can impact on the decision-making process. And underlying all of this, remember, we're all human. And we all have cognitive biases. And we all, and particularly in this interface of communicating between the science community, the policy community, the political community, and society, you will find our cognitive biases play an enormous role. We can be myopic. We tend to focus, as politicians certainly do, and the public often does, on the short term rather than the long term. We can be, have amnesia, forget to the lessons of the past rather rapidly. As I alluded to in the discussion on the risk register, we can, we can be seen to have overstated the case and, our, and the cognitive biases of the people who we're talking to will tend to favour a more optimistic understanding. Inertia is, of course, an enormous issue. And in general, as a society, we rather reward people who fix a problem than people who prevent a problem. And so a challenge, which as I look more and more at the interface between science, policy, policy and politics, science and society, is working out better ways of communicating and dealing with these cognitive biases. This is where, of course, the principles of co-design, the principles of post-normal science, uh, the principles of transdisciplinarity are so important. And I think we need to take the lessons from COVID and apply them in a more general context as we think generally about the issues of how we live in a fast changing world with a range of existential threats. The uncertainties ahead of us are, normal, are enormous. Resilience requires preparing for things that may happen. That means understanding risk, it means understanding uncertainties, but actually preemptively preparing for those events or those situations. For the reasons I've discussed, I think there are practical limitations in how, in how we do that systematically as countries. And I think there are cognitive biases we need to address and understand better if we're gonna make rapid progress. I've talked about COVID, but the ra broader range of issues ahead of us are enormous. I wish you well with your symposium. Thank you very much.